in Europe and the U.S. called GoTo Conferences, and uh, actually QCon forked from that. So the same mafia were along, all involved in uh, doing these things. A group of people that really care that people uh, keep advancing. And uh, since there aren't uh, any CEOs or CIOs in the room, the real mission of Yao is to basically knock those people out of those positions and put people in there who understand what software is about. Uh, and we've been doing this for 10 years in Australia, 20 years in Europe. And uh, we now have many, a couple of whom I mentioned there, Nigel Dalton uh, from realestate.com, uh, amazing company, 800 people doing agile teams, uh, uh, doing VR, uh, all sorts of really advanced techniques. Uh, it's a great place. And even the lawyers and the uh, finance people use story cards. So a very, very interesting environment. So we've been uh, successful with part of the revolution, but the journey goes on. Um, we like to compliment user groups. Uh, special thanks to uh, Stanley Yao and the team from Agile Singapore. Uh, we've uh, agreed to essentially partner with them. They're kind of exhausted from doing Agile Singapore, and uh, we're interested in... Uh, uh, having something that had a, the technical side of Agile as well as the, the other side of Agile. They've done a fantastic job. I had the privilege of being at the conference here uh, last October. And so uh, we're hoping to uh, earn your respect and do as, as good a job as they've done because they made a fantastic uh, contribution to the community. We have a bunch of other conferences. There's call for, call for papers. Our big conferences, we invite the speakers. Uh, for our smaller conferences, we have a few speakers that contributed. We have a conference on data. If you want to you know, speak in Sydney, we actually we actually pay contributions for speakers to get there because we understand you can't just go to a conference and maybe your boss is too cheap. And we want to help out. We want to change that too. So. Uh, and we have a connected conference shortly after, there, which is uh, basically on mobile and Internet of Things. But uh, you didn't come to hear any more marketing, so uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you about 10 ways to accelerate software development. Um, this talk actually, uh, uh, just a quick outline, but the background for this talk is basically I'm old and every once in a while people get me to talk about all the old things, right? I mean, today I'm doing vector functional programming, and I wish you guys would wake up and stop using that stupid Scala and, and closure and all these slow, inefficient, gratuitously bulky languages, but perhaps you'll catch on, you know, that if an old guy could do it, what's wrong with you young, smart people? You're still on the Java virtual machine. You'll never do big data with that. <laughs> Hadoop, you've got to be joking. HDFS, the world's most inefficient file system. Right? Oh well, you know, I'm sorry if I already upset you. <laughs> but I was an old professor, and still am, so I like to poke the students a bit. So basically, when people ask me to do this talk, that's my first comment. If you have projects in your organization, just forget it, go someplace else. Agile, lean is about building products product culture is very different than a project culture. Um, and uh, if you don't get that, then you know, don't worry about it. Uh, so I've been doing software for actually over four decades. Um, and I've, everything I've learned, I've learned by working with other smart people, many of them students. I always hire second year students because second year students are not biased by anything. They're very malleable, so you can teach them how to build software your wrong way, and then you can hire them afterwards. And in Canada, we have something called co-op education, where students work for four months and get paid a decent, a good salary, and then they go to school for four months. So they take, they do a five, it takes five years to do a four years degree, but they graduate with two full years of experience. And you know, but but for that, probably our Canadian education system will be as bad as many of the other computer science programs around the world. Fortunately. Uh, in Singapore, you have some very good programs, but I'm sure there's others, some places that are challenged. Uh, so basically, we used all sorts of different things. We built all sorts of different applications from embedded devices and pen computers, uh, 
uh, IBM's Java Virtual Machines, the Eclipse IDE. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I was started objects. That was a bad idea. I started the Agile Alliance. That was also a bad idea. So I'm not sure why you want to hear any more. I'm sure you won't do vector functional programming because that's too weird, which is good for me because I don't have to compete with all you really smart guys. And basically the interesting thing is I learned all these things, but every five years we changed the way we did things, which is really depressing because Agile hasn't changed in its entire lifetime, and most of you people are still doing object-oriented programming, which is 30 years old. Oh, my God. You know. Yeah, but, you know, Java is the new COBOL. <laughs> and C Sharp has better clothes, but it's still the same. <laughs> so basically, I want to share with you kind of 10 things that let us uh, develop software. Because when you're competing with really bright people like you, you have to cheat. Right? You, know, you can't, you know, there's a lot of smart people. Most people think they all live in California, but they're, they're the smart people are actually randomly distributed around the world. Many of the best in the world are probably in this audience or in this city. So, The big thing is that no matter what anybody says, when the CEO hears Agile, what they hear is agility. Agile has nothing to do with agility. <laughs> so in the end, what people really want to do is be able to do things faster. They want to change them, they want to build them. Up. So if you focus on doing things fast, that's going to get you a very good place with most companies. The other thing you need to realize is that companies only have a quarterly clock. Because they have to report to the market or look at their numbers every quarter. So if you can deliver significant value, and I stress value, not code, then you're going to make a difference. And typically, if you deliver value three times, in my experience, in any organization, all of a sudden, you get a lot more influence. Uh, this is known for many of my, my very simple words, shut up and ship. And when you ship, you get to speak. You know, so the danger is when you're doing your new startup, if you spend all your time telling everybody how great it is, and everybody will tell you, are you going to do this? And you say, yeah, we're going to include that is you'll never ship, or what your ship will be, a really ugly duckling. So, so there, is, you know, there is no silver bullet, and if you try and go fast and don't have a way to, to manage things, you're just going to make a mess. That's where technical debt comes from. Before Agile, nobody had any technical debt. <laughs> now, everybody goes along, and things are great for the first three, five, six sprints, and then they're all begging for technical debt cards. Where did that technical debt come from? Oh, from us, because we didn't know what we were doing, but we hacked the code anyway. Now we have to refactor it. And of course, you're lying because it's not refactoring. Because if it was refactoring, you'd have all the tests, and it'd be equivalence preserving with all the tests and so on. But you don't. So refactoring is really a guise to say, we really have to throw this mess out and rewrite it, isn't it? And there are no serious refactoring tools. Refactoring is a nice trick. I've worked with Bob Martin for many years. Very entertaining, but none of his programs are big enough to merit even worry about refactoring. Serious legacies, object-oriented legacies, are almost impossible to refactor. Michael Feathers is great, and Michael Feathers runs away whenever he sees, oh my god, this thing is so big. So there's a lot of things which I call the sort of naive agile, right? This is like, like story points, right? Story points are training wheels for people who one day will actually learn that businesses run in dollars and time. So, you know, we need to try and get to that because if you're gonna deliver, you have to deliver to the business. So the big thing we wanna do is actually write less code with less dependencies because that's the only way we can go faster. So there's no secret here. Basically, what I wanna do is get more functionality out of less code. If I can find a trick to do that, I'm going to be able to go faster. And of course, I also have to be able to test that because 50% of my effort is going to be tested. And I'm not going to be doing it with selenium. So we have a very simple principle called value-driven development. I'm not writing a book on BDD or anything like that. <laughs> it would be a terrible name anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the way we work is we basically essentially do something called build up value chain. So we find a place in the business where we can essentially make a big difference, an impact of like two, you know, two million to ten or twenty million dollars. Something that somebody actually up there cares about. We're not looking for a product owner or a bunch of, we're looking for something that matters. Something that's clearly visible in the value chain. So lean is the way to think top down. Agile is how individual teams work. And enterprise agile is an oxymoron. <laughs> and I did large, I transformed Cognos, I did the Cognos transformation, I did a big chunk of IBM, I did Siemens Medical. So I spent enough time in the hellhole trying to transform big organizations. Right, and then I went back to R&D and saved myself. <laughs> we quickly envision a solution, and then we typically find, we have to find some way that is different to solve this problem, because that's the only way we can really make the money. By the way, many years ago we, invited, we discovered a process which we call just-in-time software. Just-in-time software basically guarantees that if you, we don't deliver it on the day we promised to, you don't pay us. Uh, we needed something to differentiate our company, right? So we basically invented this thing, Just-in-Time Software, and told people about it, and they said, you guys are crazy. And we said, nah, we can do it. And then we found out how hard it was, but uh, the nice thing is when you actually send something out, if you have a vision as an entrepreneur, you learn how to do everything so you can actually deliver this stuff in a method. We built 10, 15 products on time, including the Java virtual machines without access to the sun. The source code, the Eclipse IDE, all those things were built in less than a year. Um, with far too many people in the case of the Eclipse IDE, it looks like it. Uh, you do ship your organization or Conway's Law, and uh, I, you, I can show you all the personalities and the locations in the Eclipse code base if you want to know. The other big thing is we innovate, but the big thing lots of people who are looking at a new way to do things don't do is validate at scale. So they say, oh, look, we're going to try, we think Scala is going to be better. You know, anybody can make that mistake. Type checking, sort of like Haskell, except it doesn't really work. But you know that's okay. You know, most of the time you get errors, and sometimes you get this big long thing you can't figure out. But it's cool. Right? Uh, sorry, I'll pick everyone's favorite button. In a minute. So the big thing we do is we validate this very quickly at scale, because scale is really what you do. And then we have to ship it in three to four months. Sometimes we fail. You know, sometimes it's five months, but it's never six or eight. So that means you have to be good at estimating. So when we're innovating, we look for particular places to insert. And what most people do is focus on the code. Changing code is really hard. The big lie in software is that software is easy to change. Right. You tell your friends, we could do that, that would be easy. It's easy for the green field. Look, I did my website with Ruby on Rails. Oh, now I want to scale it. Now I want to do this. I want to change this. Oh, well, that's going to be a little more. Oh, the technical debt cards are coming out like mad. No. But it turns out that the places of really high value are to look here. All the, place where, all the places where you've got interfaces of data. Because data is the gold to the corporation. And most of the time is the data, you can't get the data from where you have it to where you want it to be. And most programmers like it that way because they hate data. Right. How many people want to program in SQL? See, zero. You're all going to be unemployed because the future is going to be query. Programming in five years, I predict, will be largely query. If you're doing functional programming, what you're really doing is writing query. Yeah, but not an SQL. There are better languages to like general programming than SQL. Perhaps. Uh, for you. But what about if we want to spread this to the masses so that normal people could do it? Like, I think people here are normal. And SQL is mainly the, like 
trading block. It's nothing like fancy about Haskell. It's like it's simpler than Scala or Java. How many people have found Haskell easy? Tried it? Yeah. I rest I, my I, case. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many people try it? Uh, look, we, I don't want to go off on it. Why, okay. why, why don't we take it in the questions? Your point's well made. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm picking some extremes for the thought experiment, not because they're necessarily 100% yeah. true. Okay. So if you look at these points, these are easy places to insert things and improve flow. Because typically, if you know Don Reinerson's book, which is the only really, really good book in Lean, the book called Flow, basically, what you really want to be able to do is optimize these value chains and improve flow. If you have to, you can go over and look over here in the code. You know, small computational bottlenecks. It can do, you know, you can take, you know, so you have some Martin Thompson style analysis, reprogram in a small subset of Java, get the performance up there, use C++ with the atomics, uh, find out how to use Haskell so you can make it fast, which is a bit of a challenge, but can be done. Uh, or points of high variability, places where there's lots of change, uh, or points where a large number of defects. Anything, any seriously re defective model module, what you want to do is cut it out. Right. In general, any code that survives three releases is going to bite you. Right. If you're in release seven of some code, you know it really stings. Right. So in general, you're constantly doing this, and in many cases, it's not refactoring, it's replacing. And, and in the reasonable language, it's easier to replace than it is to try and refactor. Sorry about all that object coupling and inheritance and all those bad ideas that we told you about many years ago. Yeah. I, too, was a stainful sinner, but now I'm, to I'm totally immutable. So. We just assume that you've got a healthy software environment, right? If you don't have small teams and do things the right way, if you don't have continuous testing, just give up. So you know, I have nothing. I have no help for you if you're not in that world. Except I can give you some counseling. Right? <laughs> um, I counsel a lot of executives who think that you know, they can drink the agile Kool-Aid and you know, oh, you'll all be agile. IBM transitioned 200 200,000 people in one year by you know getting. You know, Mary, Pop and Dick, and all the people came in, they sprayed a hose over everyone and said, you are agile. <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> okay, so now let's get on to this. Okay, so basically I'm going through the life cycle from beginning to end, and I'm just throwing out a technique which we found useful. None of these, what I claim, are original. Uh, I, I wish I could attribute them all. In many cases, uh, different people at different times, we work with, refine them, improve them and the answer is if we wrote this any of this down as a process it would be completely obsolete because any time every five years you toss out everything you knew and you adopt new techniques um, so first thing is something we call extreme design uh, I learned this as a young engineering graduate uh, one of my classmates started a hardware company said oh my god we have to build software uh, I was a university professor and he convinced me to leave for a couple of years had his software organization and if you know how most hardware engineers write software it's uh, you know, kind of like many people write spreadsheets right? um, but it works and in many cases the software is fairly small so it's not really too big a problem they do believe in testing um, so but they had this crazy idea. They would take four or five engineers, and the marketing department said, we'd like to, we'd like to bid on this project. You know, we'd like to get this business. So they'd give you essentially the, you know, the RFP, the, the document they were going to bid on, and they said, OK, would you please go out and tell us how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to build this? I'm, you know, three, four years out of school, um, go to this thing. They provided dinner, a big whiteboard, and a lot of paper to write on. And the first thing was actually a side-looking radar. You know, 
know, I had no idea what a side, I what a radar was, but I had no idea what a side-looking radar was or anything else. I'm just like, this is like completely nonsense. Right? Surprisingly, you sort of take the pieces apart. Someone explains how it's how it works, and guess what? In a couple of hours, you figured out all the things you know about this. You've actually figured out what the hardware pieces are, what the boards are, what the software comp key cloud software components are in a couple of hours. And you have some people there that have done some of the things before, so they said, okay, it's kind of this much software, that's probably how long it's going to take us, assuming we're writing it in C, uh, which we were. Uh, now the hardware is going to take sort of this long. And so after this sort of four hours and eating dinner, we would actually go back to the marketing department with an estimate. Now what's an estimate? An estimate's a distribution. Who gives single point estimates? You're all losers. No one should estimate with a single point. An estimate's a distribution. So the easy way is what's, what's your high bid, what's your low bid, right? How long is it gonna take someone to put a man on Mars? Well, Anita will tell us that answer, but you know, you can probably say, you know, 20 to 50 years. The nice thing about a, a safe range is that it is safe, right? Because you've got to express that there's risk in there. So we didn't get the right answer, but we basically provided it. And, and so this became very, very important. We figured out what we did know, what we didn't know, and what sort of technology and practice we use. And sometimes people would go, I remember the first time I worked in a GE, medical scanner, uh, MRI scanner, they were using Objective-C. It's very early days in object technology. They said, oh, objects, you know. There was a meeting for four hours while I debated whether or not sending messages was too expensive to use object technology. Unfortunately, it was a break for lunch, and they had a, had a summer student that I met in the hallway, and I said, would you please go down to the lab, <coughs> write something that sends 10 million messages, and time it and pass me a note through the door. <laughs> and we were able to kill this whole discussion of a whole lot of people who didn't know what they were talking about because they didn't do an experiment. All right, so experimenting for, and we estimated the code. And from this, we actually ended up building a lot of things. So basically, the first rule of estimates is use two or three point estimates. And you know, in the end, everything's in dollars. And, and days, so why not use them? Once you get used to money, and once you get used to days, they're not so bad. That's how the company works anyway. And besides the day, when you do your story points, up there somewhere, some poor guy's gotta convert all your story points into dollars and days anyway. So, great, use story points because you're afraid. But the real issue that you're afraid is because you can't give the distribution. And the big problem is people tell executives you know, November, and then deliver in March, because you don't expose them to the risk, and that's very important. Now, if you're doing a big project, and you're guaranteeing it's gonna be delivered on time. So we're basically building, you know, the virtual machine and the IDE, and we're guaranteeing that's gonna be delivered in a year, and a fixed price to IDE. Reasonably challenging, given that Java had just been out for a couple of years, uh, we didn't really know Java all that much. Uh, we didn't have the source code uh, because we wanted a clean room version. We didn't want to depend it on Sun, uh, now Oracle. So you really want some other way to qualify this. This is why you use activity-based estimates. So if you take, kind of take the product that you're building, uh, I think this one came from an insurance company, so I am sorry if it's boring, but basically you sort of say, okay, consider this thing to be a bunch of parts. There's some Java code, classes, methods, there's some APIs, uh, there's various kinds of tables for pricing, rating tables, there's some workflow processes, there's some data, you know, it's gonna be probably relational tables, there's some rules, maybe a rule engine, maybe simple decision tables, forms, screens, printed things. That's kind of what most insurance systems are made up of. And if you keep the data or metrics for this, I didn't say the word Kokomo, uh, then you basically have kind of typical distributions for what it took to do this in another project, or if you've never programmed in Java before, you get somebody else in who has the experience, because there's kind of metrics of work 
for how long it takes you to build a class in C++ versus Java versus C Sharp. They're pretty close in those two. But, you know, if you're the first time you're doing Scala, you may want to know kind of what the metrics are like there. So when you do this, you've got your sort of story estimate, right, in ranges. Really big featured estimates. And, it's a bit, and then you have your activities by looking at kind of what the, what's the manufacturing going to take? How many of these things are there? APIs take, are harder to write than Java classes, right? So they take longer. Even a BA, once they know, you know, or a product owner, once they know that an API is hard, they go, oh. As soon as the developer mentions they need an API, they go find another, another feature they want instead because they know they're going to get taxed for three months for an API. So they actually start making business decisions without even knowing much about the technology because they have a sense of the cost of the complexity of doing this. And what executives get then is a risk window. Basically, this is what the story estimate is, this is what the activity estimate is, and if the executive bets this point, they will probably be a loser. They'll never bet this point because that's not what executives do, so they'll end up somewhere in here. But this works for very, very large projects that are fixed time, guaranteed delivery. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more you keep statistics on how you do it uh, and learn from your data, the better. Okay, so enough of that. So the big thing we found, particularly with Agile teams, is they build the wrong thing. And since code's so hard to fix, what we want to do is find a way not to do this. So we use an activity we call envisioning or just enough design. And uh, there's a bunch of things in here. These all come from product engineering, by the way. Um, many of them are not in any Agile books because Agile doesn't realize that there's a whole thing called product engineering that existed before Agile existed. And uh, we all know that basically on the front of the card is the story, on the back of the card is acceptance test, acceptance criteria. You, you all know that, right? This is how high I have to jump. That actually, we did that at Object Mentor, so. Uh, acceptance criteria is actually trademarked Dave Thomas, not that I care. So. You know, this is a classic example. You've got the horrible waterfall calculator, but then you've got the agile, you know, Bob Martin calculator. Bob's a good friend of mine, so I like to poke jokes at him. <laughs> and so, you know, basically, you build up one thing, everybody writes the test, you build this. Now, if you're actually building a real calculator and you have to make the plastics and the software together, uh, this doesn't work out too well because you get a calculator that can do add, and you say, we'll ship the first release. And everybody takes, this is a useless calculator, I need to do multiplication and division. So what you really want to do is do just enough design to shorten this. And we basically have a rule that we have to build every product three times. So we get it wrong the first time, really wrong, but we do it really cheap. We get it better the second time, but still wrong, it's usually too slow and too big. And then the third time it's usually okay. And then you have to throw it away and start over again. That's the depressing part. Uh, so this is an example. This is a large, it's now an IBM product, but it's a, uh, a system that basically globally uh, checks websites for large corporations to make sure they're you know, access compliant, secure, everything you want to do to check uh, global corporate websites. Uh, make sure there's you know, their language enabled, all those sorts of things. And it's a very impressive product. It's actually, I think it's owned by IBM today, built by a company called Watchfire in Ottawa, where I live. And it's built by a great team of Canadian engineers and has a user interface that looks like it. Very complicated, very hard to use. So they had to build a new user interface because no one could use the product. And so they said, would you help us? Now, fortunately, the engineers were all busy fighting over which UI framework to use so we had a lot of time to actually work on this. We had a couple months. So basically we built a low fidelity prototype interaction model, very simple, three, three different models, you know, basically two different visual forms, different navigation, and these little red dots are things you can click on and explore what it looks like. Um, we then basically did a concept prototype 
which basically went from eight pages to 48 pages. This is a, this is a very complicated product. This is a lot of configuration. Again, three internal designs, two external ones. We actually put it on an external visible part of the website. Really upset the company because I never wanted to show people what the UX looked like before it was built. You know, after all, why do you want customers giving you input? You might have, there are lots of UX silos inside companies, right? Everybody else posts their intermediate designs up on what they're doing, their iteration. But the UX people, they wait until the last one and then they put it up and say, the UI is done. Maybe UX people are not like that. But basically, the UX silo is often as bad as a data silo in many organizations. So the last one is very complete. Three more iterations, uh, 148 pages, uh, external sessions, less, per, less than 2% of the overall effort. Customers loved it. How was this built? It was really built by one guy over a period of a couple months because he had to wait for people to come back. It's built with interactive power. How many story cards will that take? Billions. Can, you inter can the customer really interact with it? We've built many things, including complete IDEs and so on, just with, we, the only reason we use PowerPoint is so we don't have to argue about them buying iRise or something else and having a tool fight. Right. It does have authentic timing in it, so it isn't completely fake. When you actually click the page, it says, show me all the servers around the world. We actually know we went and measured the time in the product to do that. So if you click something like that, you'll see the appropriate delay. So it's authentic in terms of the experience. It doesn't give you instant response to show me 10,000 servers. And that means you typically will change the UI so you'll show people servers in a given geography or things like that so you don't have to wait for the whole thing. The easiest way to build things is not to write very much software at all. The best way to do envisioning is basically to take the three products that you want to take out in the market, your three competitors, and put those products together and say, I like what's in this one, I like what's in this one, I like what's in this one, and I don't want this, and here's my other idea. That's called delta analysis. Much easier than doing anything else. They already wrote the spec for you. And often we actually build the product on top of somebody else's product. We do the mock-up, we stick things in front of it, so people can see it, and they say they like it. We can build things very quickly this way. And sometimes if we need to write code, we'll write it in, in something fast. You know, pick your favorite scripting language. Uh, so we can actually do that. But we'll also test the hardware, too. So we want to know, OK, if we're going to use IPP, IPv6, how hard is that going to be? We'll actually go and do an IPv6 test. So we do lots and lots of little experiments. So we gain a ton of knowledge. And then we can refine the estimates, because we've actually tried to build this. So that's envisioning. It's a way to see where you're going. And it basically means that you get the best wrong answer, as opposed to just starting from a bunch of requirements. Architecture. Uh, to me, architecture equals APIs. I don't believe in non-functional requirements anyways. If you have a non-functional requirement, security, performance, uh, then you should have a story for it, and you should have an acceptance criteria. If your performance group is at the back end of your process along with your testing, you just don't do non-functional requirements. Probably the key secret with non-functional requirements is get rid of them. Make them quantifiable so you can test them. So basically, we all know architects is a, is a, a role, not a job. Uh, except for enterprise architects, I don't know what they do. Uh, it's basically expressed in the code, so you should be able to get all the diagrams, any other thing you want from the code. It's all about trust the code loop. So what you do is you version your APIs into the code. You can do this in any language. You may have to have a comment convention if the language doesn't support packages or interfaces or whatever it is, but you can do it. And that means you can actually say, What's the architecture? And the code will tell you. I can't tell you how many companies I go into and you say, so what's the architecture of this application? There's arm waving and 
somebody says, well, we did some UML diagram somewhere, or whatever it is. And there's a picture on the wall, but it's really wrong because we did that a long time ago. Of course, you know, we're agile, so we don't need any documentation anyway, uh, because we're just going to go away and let somebody else fix this code after we're done. <laughs> Here's the story part. Smoke some dope. Protocols are very important because they really describe an API. And one of the things that people really understand is a protocol is really uh, essentially a set of messages. And what you really want to test is the protocol. So it's, you, know, you can think of it as a class signature or the function signature. But basically, you know, for a file, the protocol is open, read, write, star, close. That's the Apathic version. You can actually put counters in the code to verify this. And if Haskell and other people ever figure out how to do session types properly, you'll actually be able to have them type checked in your language. But that's currently beyond the current state of practice with regard to type checking. But it's a really good technique. Uh, so what we try and do is figure out what the key APIs are. We don't get it all right. Uh, but we try and figure out what the key components are. I'm talking about reasonably large things now and major, major products. You know, obviously, if you're doing a single app or something like that, you don't need to do this stuff. Right? So when you get to build these things, the good news is machines are really fast. So once again, basically really bad software is going to be saved by hardware. Right? So instead of having this big monolith now, which you can't refactor, you will have a whole lot of microservices. And if you do it wrong, like many people, you'll have what I call dependency preserving microservices where the version signatures between all the messages is such that you still can't build independently. This is usually the first mistake of people doing microservices. Ah, we broke up the model, it's all curious stuff, everything's in microservices, but we still can't release any piece independently. You missed the point. So we want isolation, uh, and we can do that because hardware is cheap, lots of processes. In the old days it wasn't, it wasn't that people didn't know this was a good idea, it's just that the hardware didn't support it. It was expensive. The simplest kind of service is one-way data flow. Fred talks a lot about those. Those are easy to do. They're easy to build. Uh, a simple message, you know, pushing messages on the bus, kind of an event model or data flow model. Uh, you can also look at this new, basically, uh, a much simpler way to do these things instead of having to deploy a whole bunch of VMs and a whole lot of services, which is why if you see uh, my good friend Adrian Krokoff now, who's an uh, uh, architect for uh, Amazon, basically he's talking about no ops. Right? Instead of having DevOps and everybody learning how to spin up all the VMs and start all these microservices, basically you just put functions into it, into a service. You can just invoke, so for simple data flow calculations, you can just do that with lambdas. Whack, 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 whack. Uh, and you eliminate having to do all this. Sorry if you're just learning about this you now. Uh, it'll still be here for a couple of years until no ops becomes a way. Uh, but, you know, it's just too hard to do all this stuff. Right? Uh, occasionally disconnected. The only thing hard in mobile is occasionally disconnected. Right? Mobile is wonderful, except you don't have reliable sessions. Right? Uh, and so the solution here is replication and sync. It's very well known that many people don't architect their mobile applications from the beginning to replication, replicate and sync, and so it gets very difficult. If you really want to build complicated systems, so if you want to get into microservices which are messaging both ways and doing this, you have just stepped into an area that's much more complicated than you think. So my recommendation is if you can, try and use simple data flow microservices. Um, when you get in this world, you really need to know about asynchronous state machines, distributed state machines, and uh, that's going to take you on a journey uh, that's a little harder to do. So if you want to build something maximally concurrent, high performance, uh, you're now basically doing what the guys who design telecom switches do. And if you want to really understand microservices, even though you really want to program in a little language called Go, uh, look at Erlang and Erlang OTP because it is the exemplar for how to build reliable fault-tolerant distributed systems. 
and particular, you know, the principle, you know, no exceptions, right? In Erlang, it's wonderful when they, when a process or a service gets an exception, it just fails, right? And then the Erlang supervisor hierarchy does the recovery, spins up another one, and so on. This is also why, you know, why do you use weird languages? Because they have the best ideas. And so, slowly, many of these ideals will mi migrate in, but a lot of the things that you can do in Java, whatever, look simple, but when you get into architecting these complicated things, you'll see that you need the kind of actor principles that are in Erlang and things like that. But you don't, if you don't want to worry about that, keep it simple. That's always true, so you know, if you don't... Um, this came up the last two times I did. Does the language and tooling matter? The answer is sometimes. The answer is if you can really do things like an order of magnitude faster, then it matters. But, you know, using C Sharp versus Java, it's kind of the same thing. Um, so often it really doesn't. I know you want to use Emacs versus Vim or an IDE, but, you know, among equal programmers, these things don't tend to make a huge, huge difference. Obviously, they do if they, somebody takes you and forces you to do it because you've got, you know, I know where the hotkeys are in Emacs, right? So and then I, I got it. Oh, that was IDE. E. God, this is horrible or beautiful. Since I'm an e builder, IDE builder, you wouldn't expect me to like using Emacs, but I do. What you do for customers isn't necessarily what you do for yourself. So these things can make it, but some languages are really good at a certain kind of application. And if you happen to be doing something that's you're really building a distributed system, even if you're going to build it in some other language because you thought that was safer or whatever, you know, we can build it in Java because getting Java programmers is easy. This is the wisdom of you know the organization. It's really easy to get Java programmers. Yeah, but can you get any good ones? The problem of plenty is there are not many good ones. So good people in any language are hard. But organizations like to believe that if they choose a widely used programming language, things will be better. Um, you know, little knowing how great it would be if they programmed in Haskell, which has a very robust system and so on. Uh, I bought back some friends. Yeah, another option is like if you're firing Haskell programmers to code in Java, it's still be way better if you're firing Java programmers to write Java. I, I'm not quite sure that I agree. Uh, <laughs> a point here, uh, I, I, th I think I think the, what you're really saying is that the people who study Haskell often have very strong degrees and are, and are very bright and talented. So there's some self-election, some self-selection in there. Yeah. I'm not sure it's because they never necessarily did Haskell. Yeah. yeah. Because of self-education, they uh, you know, If you don't have coding guidelines and a lint tool to check your code, it's crazy because, you know, you can't do JavaScript unless you have standards, right? I mean, so that, if you've got 20, 20 JavaScript programmers, you have a nightmare, right, if you can't standardize them. Unless you want to be like Facebook or whatever it is, I think. And then they have a whole infrastructure for time to deal with the PHP mess and the JavaScript mess. They do a very good job for it. And the same applies to Scala these days. Hmm? The same applies to Scala these days. 20 Scala engineers will like produce like very different Scala and like yeah. putting them to, together. Yeah. So, yeah. Could, yeah. obviously, uh, I'll talk later about testing because so how many people do proper? How many people know what property-based testing is? Oh, good. Okay, so you got nothing else out of this talk? Go look at property-based testing. I'll talk about it later. And the issue of test versus types. It's always a debate uh, in languages that you can write fast in. Uh, basically, you're asserting properties. The assertion of the properties essentially is an enforcement of a type constraint. However, they're not going to be. You know, they're not going to be complete, like a type, full type. So, in general, the most important thing is you agree on what the tools are that your team uses. And if you have some very special purpose thing, uh, maybe using a strange language, or uh, I will call it exotic language, since I program in a language called Q, which is very exotic. Uh, the other thing that software people seem to not like is data. The bad news is all we have and in the future world is data. But programs are going to be much more important and much smaller in many cases because they're just computing over data. In fact, they're doing queries, whether they're doing it with a functional programming language or uh, some dialect that was a query language. 
So most applications are still just doing CRUD. You never know it because there's layers of caches and REST services and all sorts of you know, interference in the way. So first of all, this should be obvious, uh, but you know, some people actually think that JSON is a good idea. Uh, hopefully no one in this room. Uh, please make sure your data has a schema and maybe version it. Uh, I won't tell you how many companies where their data pipeline, the UI people keep adding new JSON attributes in the middle, at the end, on the side, so they have to know every time that JSON was changed and change their pipeline uh, to do the analysis. So, it's all, all this so please, if you're going to use some, time, some other kind of thing, please have a version and a schema so you know when it's changed. And also a way to morph from the previous representation to the next representation or else you'll never be able to process it. If you know, how many people know about ER models? Any relationship models? If you care about data, you should know what these are because the semantics matters. Relational tables lose semantics in many cases. Um, and there are really good query languages that go against the model. Um, make everything query uh, using modern, so the only API most things should write first is a query API. You go along and say, oh, I got these REST services, right? 100, 200 REST services, right? All with really nice names. Get this, put that, find this. Most APIs, the most important one is query. Write a general query API and it'll be much, much faster. Um, whenever you see text, convert it to binary. Do not allow the text to go past that point. Do you want to be fast? Text takes up 10 times the space. Sorry, that's 30 times because you've got HDFS, so you have to replicate it at least three times. So it's now 30 times bigger. Go for DFS. It's only one and a half times bigger. Maybe. You want to compress it. No, no, DFS does uh, use compression. Use different distribution to um, yeah. force right. redundancy. Right. So it's now only one and a half. <laughs> Still huge. But the real problem is the one thing we can't do easily in parallel is parse text. So you now pay a major execution cost. And this is for all you horrible people who use NoSQL. You all loved it as programmers because you didn't have to know anything. You could just shove it in there. Right? Maybe you have to write all the programs that have to read that data and have to parse it over and over and over again and burn up all those cycles. Get rid of text. Get the data into binary as fast as possible. And if you want a very good efficient serialization program instead of thrift buffers or you know thrift or Google protocol buffers, this is SBE done by Martin Thompson. It's much faster than any of these things for serialization between Java, C++, C Sharp, and so on. And get rid of the instruction data. Let me speak up a bit. Um, there's a very old architecture. Um, uh, which, I mean, all the things, microservices, Lambda architecture, PubSub, basically were started in the financial industry many, many years ago. Now, once they get to California, they give them new names, like Lambda architecture, and make up something called Kafka and tell you it's really new because it's really just a logging system. Uh, and then they implement it in Java, so it can be much slower than the real implementation. Uh, why is Java bad? Because it can't actually reference more than 24 gigs of memory in any easy way. You can get around it, but the Java VMs today are designed to work on reference types. If you have lots of big data, you need value types. The reference counting, the referencing garbage collectors, therefore, are constrained to go to 24 or 32 gigs. So this is causing Spark to be completely rewritten because they have to use a, a non-Java standard architecture. Now value types, of course, are coming to Java 12 or something some year. Um, um, if they ever get Java 9. <laughs> so there's a very simple architecture of mutable data. 
which is called, in the Lambda architecture, is called an RDB, a real-time database, and a batch database. And if you want to know a consistent state, what you do is you send the query to both those databases, and you get the exact answer consistent at that point in time. And on a regular basis, the real-time database is applied to the historical or immutable database, as that immutable data is added, so at that point it becomes 100% consistent, which is typically maybe some a couple of points during the day, depending on your volume. In the financial industry, it's guaranteed overnight because there are windows when there is no stuff being processed. Very simple scalable architecture because you can set up these to be, it's immutable, uh, which is claimed to be a thing from functional programming, but immutable data existed long before functional programming tried to claim it. Uh, and the other thing is get rid of as many data caches as possible. A cache is a bet with the devil. But you bet that you're going to be right, and then you have to worry about clearing it, resetting it. Uh, today, there's modern in-memory databases that handle all this stuff. Instead of you manually figuring out how to, should I put this in memcache or Redis and then put it back into Postgres or whatever, get yourself a real in-memory database so you can do this properly. And basically, traffic and records and tables, you know, we all know that no one should use an ORM. Right? ORM is just a way to slow down data and waste memory and waste the garbage collector. So you want a traffic in static data, and you want to minimize the number of data conversions, especially text. The other thing that's very important is that programmers are really expensive, software is really expensive, and hardware is really cheap. And you know, really fast hardware, it doesn't talk back, it doesn't complain, it doesn't have technical debt cards, it doesn't whine. So, this is actually old, but if you go to Dell online site, you could buy a box for fifteen thousand uh, dollars, which is a lot cheaper than I can pay a programmer even in Singapore. And you know, I get a terabyte of RAM, hundred terabytes of disk, and sixty-four cores. Which size disk? <laughs> which size disk? Yeah, it's not cheap. What? Go to Dell. So, you know, things become really interesting when you get machines like this, right? You need fewer programmers because you're not, you know, working with several representations. For many people, their entire data set fits, fits in that one terabyte. Guess what? Queries are pretty fast. Programs are very simple. You, know, you don't even need complicated indexing and things like that. I mean, clearly you can use indexing. Uh, and basically, you know, all the interesting data is in memory. Uh, uh, there is a new technology coming called NVMe memory, uh, 3D crosspoint memory. Uh, both of these are from Intel. One's a little faster, one's a little slower. This is cheap, oh sorry, less expensive. No, I think it's cheap. Uh, for me it's cheap because the programmers are really expensive. Uh, but this memory is coming, is available now. Uh, we've just done a benchmark and we were six times faster than the fastest stack benchmark. Uh, NVMe memory and 3D crosspoint memory are non-volatile, byte addressable, off the bus. Faster than SSD, not as fast as RAM, so we're now seeing a memory tier. And within three to five years, there will no, not be any spinning rust. There'll be no disrupts. This is the way, if you've got HDFS, you fix it. What you do is you put big NVMe res in front of it, and then you make it faster. So there is a solution if you've got a Hadoop cluster. Right? You just put it in front and say it's just a cache, right? silicon cache. Right? I fixed my Hadoop mistake. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, the other thing is decompression and encryption is actually on board in the hardware. It's faster to send messages. Hey, Stanley, how are you doing? Uh, it's faster to send messages between processors than it is to store between processors. This is a high-speed message bus. Now, you've got 64 cores. Uh, basically, data compression and encryption is free because they're actually running on the processor, so 
is now possible to do encryption. Uh, encryption is still a little challenge, uh, but that's going to get fixed. Uh, we have to change some OSs and things like that. So you can do much simpler only. And it's very easy. Now you can start doing self-serve computing because you can actually give people out. We're talking about a petabyte of memory in a rack like this. Petabyte. Worse for security, a USB stick with 10 terabytes. <laughs> but now all these challenges of provisioning and who's going to query the data and so on, you want the data, plug the box in. So this is going to revolutionize the way people do analytics and looking at data. And it allows us to make, take really nice sort of functional programming, query-oriented programming models and make them the norm so that people can do this without a lot of complexity. Okay, so now for a re some really old tricks. When I graduated from university, there were these people called systems programmers. And systems programmers were the... You know, they were like the Unix, the, today they'd be like the Unix, Linux kernel guys or whatever it is. And they did amazing things. They all programmed in assembler, you know, machine code basically, with you know, keyword and syntax. But they had this technique. You know, you know, they were table-driven programmers. So it took me a while to understand what I mean. They basically encoded all of their operating systems, their databases, their applications into a whole set of connected tables. So essentially what they were doing is interpreting a set of tables. And this has a whole lot of things. First of all, normal people can do it. So you can actually specify the requirements. Uh, it's a very dense expression, so the tables are very dense. It's easy to recreate and refactor. You can do them in a spreadsheet. Uh, they're modular because you can break them up. Uh, you can actually check them. There's rule checkers that will check whether they're consistent or conflicting for different kinds of tables, so you can debug them. Uh, uh, they can be automated very efficiently with a very simple, fast interpreter, or you can compile them if you really want speed, but in general that's not needed. And the nice thing is, you know, how often you'd like to say, we'd like to do a hot deployment of this change in my application. Well, if it's a table, it's just data. You just update the data. It's deployed. And meanwhile, you're busy fixing your CI pipeline and everything on your continuous deployment so you can get things up to Amazon when all somebody has to do is actually write to a file. Why do you make it so hard? Put this jar over here and put it in there, change all its if statements in my code. Ah, so hard. I don't know why people do this. This is a really old idea, and I don't think they tell people about it. There's another type of table, uh, decision table. This is really good for doing complicated rules. The insurance situation I mentioned was basically, you know, you can specify your complete insurance system between spreadsheets and decision tables. You can design, you can document the requirements for what the insurance system can do. I don't have time to go through this, but there's a very compact encoding and a very simple interpreter to execute these. And I've used these in real-time control, library systems, innumerable things. It's another type of table called a state table or a state diagram. Most people study those. They're equivalent to regular expressions. So everybody's done something simple, you know. It's an A followed by three Bs followed by a C. Um, these are used in all sorts of If you have a complicated UX, even if you're using RX, Manage to figure out Rx, as there is a little learning curve. Uh, you know, basically you have to learn functional programming and a few other things. But if you have a complicated UI and you want to hold the mouse down and drag it over this and not debug all the horrible things, are the events bubbling up or bubbling down in JavaScript? And did I catch it here or catch it there? What you build is a state machine or a state chart, and you can actually define for all the UI and interaction models what's going to happen. And when you fill in that chart, you'll all see all the cases that you don't cover in your code. So this is a very powerful technique. If you want to build asynchronous communicating processes, then you have to build distributed state machines. Unfortunately, most people in modern computer science don't teach any of these things. And it's really sad. Because they're very compact, 
They're easy to implement. They're very fast to change. And the tables can be directly compiled in the code. This is another example of a table, but it's got a different evaluation model. Um, everyone loves to, loves to love and loves to hate spreadsheets. But spreadsheets are actually a very simple model for people to use. Um, I worked with a company called Xerox Special Information Systems many years ago, and they built a spreadsheet called the Analyst. And the spreadsheet serves analysts for a particular agency, and it's the only spreadsheet that can conjugate Russian verbs and analyze satellite images. But all the different users can use the spreadsheet because they understand the model. So it's a very powerful model. And today on modern hardware, the spreadsheets we build uh, have trillions of rows in a cell, so you can actually run your business on a spreadsheet. So it's a very simple uh, way to do this. You basically have to take the graph, check that it doesn't have a cycle, and then just line the things up. There's a technique called a topological sort, which does that. It's trivial to implement. You can also do it on demand, but you might as well do it, you know, sort them because it'll be faster. And then you can evaluate these things. Imagine that. Now, what you could do, of course, is you could write it in a spreadsheet or a table, and then you could write 10,000 stupid cucumber tests that are going to be wrong that you have to maintain, and then have that all implemented in Java and waste all your money and time. Please. Many of these things can be automated right from the requirements, and the user can change the table. So instead of the poor BA suffering learning, you know, when, some, buy, you know, so because the programmer doesn't want to understand anything about the domain, you know, which is ridiculous. If you want programmers to do something, don't use Cucumber. Go teach them about your domain. When we hire people in finance, we teach them finance and options, and then we teach them coding. We do it together so they can talk to the finance users. Otherwise, you know, you're just a programming robot, you know. Here's the Cucumber, make it work. And you all these fragile tests, fragile Cucumber, fragile unit tests, Technical debt, please, no more. I love GoCo, I love BDD, but for the right job. So you can often automate all these things. And when you automate them, you can actually do this. So here's an example, this is a real system, and actually somebody who may have heard of Kent Beck, the guy who invented XP, can't work on this system. It was originally in Smalltalk, but now it's in Java. It really doesn't matter. There's not that much difference between Smalltalk and Java, except you know, one's easy to use and the other one's hard, but you know, they have similar ideas. So this is a company happens to be based in Chicago, and they do the benefit calculations for a whole lot of other companies. So if you work for a DBS, and they give you, for example, in America, they give you a little card that says, DBS loves you. If you have any questions about your benefits, call this 1-800 number, and we'll take care of you. And what happens is someone answers and says, Hi, I'm from DBS Benefits, I'm here to help you. Well, they actually work for this company. So the, the, they basically outsource almost everybody's benefits. Well, benefits calculations are very complicated. You know, in the United States, for example, if you live, if you live in Colorado, you get the first three, to three days of hunting season off. Right? There's all sorts of goofy rules like this. Probably I'm Canadian, so I'm more rude than anybody else. Uh, so, Basically, Ken was in here, and of course they had small talk, which is you know really fast, and you can refactor really easily. Uh, that's where the refactoring was easy, and then when you have Java, it gets much harder. Uh, and basically, so they captured the requirements because they'd actually been negotiating meetings with all the guys smoking big cigars and drinking in those days, negotiating with the unions and so on. And the analysts are working out in the spreadsheets what the benefits are going to be and when the pays are going to get out. And, all these things. And then they come out and they had 100 COBOL programmers because it ran on the mainframe. Still running on the mainframe. Uh, and they were saying it's just too slow to get this done. So of course we went in with the latest. This was before, uh, this was actually before Kent wrote the book XP. Uh, actually this wasn't that long before C30. And basically they did sort of agile and OO and they got a 10 to 50 percent speed up. Yawn. Why would anybody do that much change? We're going to retrain all these, you know, COBOL programmers in the small talk programmers to get 10 percent. Why not? Everybody else is doing it. 
ten percent is a big deal for people who can't get anything done. Agile basically makes it so that people who couldn't get any software done now can barely get some done. I hope this, this is going to be recorded. I'm <laughs> but I'm known for being pretty outrageous. So basically, this is, uh, this is a very big IBM customer at the time. And, then, and we had basically we had main we had small talk that would run on the mainframe or the workstation or whatever. And everyone sort of darn. You know, we're not the miracle drug. What do we do? Kent very astutely said, look, they've already written everything down in the spreadsheets. We're trying to take all the stuff from the spreadsheets, which often have bugs in them, and rewrite that in code. Tons of code. Suppose we could just execute the spreadsheet. So they wrote a spreadsheet interpreter in Smalltalk. It's in Java today. Still running. Talks to the COBOL program and everything like that. Just running, no problem. Multiple languages work even on a mainframe. Uh, they wrote a spreadsheet validator because there were bugs. Two guys wrote this. All the other people were already deployed. Somewhat productivity two small applications. I can't tell you how many times we've used this trick. Many times for the four. Okay. How many people have to deal with enterprise applications and things like that, right? Congratulations, you get to talk to SAP BW, you poor so-and-so. Um, so, one of the easiest ways to do this, the, the big thing you want to do is, to, when, if you have to talk to you know, most existing applications, when they say they've got APIs, they basically had no APIs, and then what they do is they come along and drill holes in them and put in APIs, and then they give them names and sort them alphabetically so you can't figure out what they are. All these big systems are like this. And usually the API gives you half of what you need to know, and usually it does it slowly. So you have to write all these interfaces and service to all these APIs. This is called you know, enterprise integration, and lots of people do it. Oh, we're putting you know, the API field of dreams. Give them another 100 APIs, and the application will come. You were wishing on it. So the first thing I do is I actually read the data physically from the disk. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, so it turns out that the disk formats are actually very stable. And there's not much difference between an Oracle page and a total DB page, you never heard of it, it's old database. Almost all databases, uh, the physical page format is pretty well known, and everybody's afraid to change it, and nobody encrypts it. Maybe they will if the legislation changes. So we can actually, we can actually write software that sits in the SAN arrays and read all the disks blazingly fast. Put it into in memory, and we just get at the data instantly. What APIs did we use? Zero. That's why it's fast. The other thing is you can make read-only replicas for something. So you put everything in Mongo because it was easy, and then you found out people wanted to report from it, so then you can write another program that replicates it into MySQL, and then everybody can use Crystal Reports or anything else. <laughs> we made it really fast for us. Now we made it too slow for them, so we have a fix. Install another tool, replicate it, usual stuff. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Turns out that almost every all software out there, whether it's written by old company, IBM, DEC, you know, Univac, or new company, has Atom feeds or RSS feeds on it. Even IBM's oldest products actually will actually give you all the journals and everything in RSS or Atom format. So once you've done this, you can now consume it with web tooling. There is no API. There's one API called REST in Atom. Or another thing is a query SBI. And often, if you have a really ugly old database or an old store, you know, you decide, you know, this will be you trying to get your data out of Mongo in the future. But so what you want is make it usable in Mongo. So what you do is you buy an OEM uh, ODBC driver and you hook it into Mongo so you can take things that look like SQL queries and execute them in Mongo, do all the parsing behind the scenes so that you won't have to make all the users suffer for the fact you use Mongo 
uh, or any other uh, blob store, not picking on Mongo specifically, but it's big and profitable, so fine. You do this, then you can basically handle it. Really simple. Again, all we did was democratize the data. Here's an example. Big industrial factory control. $300 million with the factory control equipment. You know these companies, uh, I've probably I'm already naming names, but people like Rockwell and ABB, they make all sorts of special control systems and they program them in a specialized language called ladder logic, uh, which is, has some really interesting properties about it, about correctness and so on, so it's not, uh, it's a, it has a the nice thing that the, uh, the programs you write are deterministic, which is very, very important in process control. But they actually make everything non-standard. They take the pins on the bus and switch them around so they're non-standard, so you can't plug anybody else's boards into the machine and do all sorts of nasty things like that. And they patent that as some reason that their system is better because they put the pins backwards because somehow there's some benefit of doing this. This is the best of proprietary. So you've got all this equipment, and now what are you going to do? Well, of course, what you do is you have a team that's going to rewrite everything, or you're going to buy all new equipment. It's not going to happen. So the solution is pretty obvious. First thing you do is you basically stick a TCP IP card, because they all have proprietary buses and messaging and so on. You stick a TCP IP card into the main controller so it can talk to the bus on one side in its proprietary format and talk to you TCP IP. So now I can talk to it. What should I talk to it in? Well, if I just take all those messages and expose them through a web interface, I can now build my whole control room with a bunch of Websters, assuming they understand how to do web sockets and asynchronous stuff, but you know, good ones will. So coming up to the end, testing. Testing is still hard, really hard. Uh, it all starts with acceptance criteria including illities. If you don't have performance requirements, you won't have performance. If you don't have usability requirements that you can test, how many clicks before I get the patient in the hospital? I won't say who this was for, but it took 50 clicks, 50 plea strokes to get a patient into the door in the emergency room, even when they were bleeding all over the floor. <laughs> I think they need an acceptance grade. And those run every bill. And if the performance changes or the usability changes, that they, it breaks the bill, right? You can't deploy. There is a technique called property-based testing that I want to talk about it, and I'll talk about the others, and then I'll be done. Going on too long anyways, my apology. Um, property-based testing was invented by uh, a wonderful guy called John Hughes, with, with John Hughes last week in Lambda Jam in Australia, uh, was done for Haskell. It's called Quick Check. And basically, what Quick Check does is you assert essentially this program will satisfy these properties, so you build simple models which are in the beginning kind of just equational statements. And then you say, I'd like to run this on my desktop 10,000 times and in my build 100,000 times. And what it does is it takes that test specification and it has generators for each of the types. And if you have fancier types, then you get to add your own generators. And it generates random values from, the, from those generators and does all the tests. Now, randomized testing has been around for a long time. And the good news is it definitely finds bugs. The bad news is it gives you a huge list of things that fail. So if you generate a million tests, you probably end up with 10,000 failures. And people go, well, you know, I gotta look for the false positives, I gotta figure out what. The big thing that John did is it has something called shrink. So what it does is when you get the failing test, it finds the smallest sequence of operations that fails. And this has been used to find serious bugs in things like React, which is one of the best distributed systems, 90% uh, coverage written by PhDs, uh, John worked on it and found like eight critical bugs and something with 95% code coverage. LevelDB, which is in your browser, done by Google, 
super smart guys. Basically, they found a sequence of 24 operations that caused level DB to fail. At first, it was sort of contested. That's not really true. Uh, Google issued a patch a couple of weeks later. Uh, a couple of weeks later, it found a sequence of 32 operations that caused it to fail. So you need to move beyond unit testing towards property-based testing. The nice thing you can kind of think of it is like a unit test, but basically it gives you as many as you ask for because a unit test typically only asserts one value, whereas this is going to suit many. So you can sort of take baby steps as saying it's a way to go from you know, getting more coverage out of the unit test. When we wrote Quick Check for our environment, people converted in a week. They just stopped writing unit tests. It's really, really good. And there is a way, because although it is functional, you can actually assert state. So if you extend it, you can actually use state. It was used to test all the Volvo automotive protocols. John's doing another project now on uh, automate, you know, basically uh, self-driving cars. Uh, this stuff is very, very handy. Uh, and that, you know, if you see that slide, that's the John's thing that talks about that. It's a great talk on, on testing the right stuff. Um, I know, well, ThoughtWorks did Selenium. But I know how wonderful Selenium is and all these things. But when you're building complicated UIs, by the time I get Selenium done, I've already changed the UI five times. So I want it to be true. If you're just doing the banking screen, enter your bank account and so on, you can definitely do it. On the other hand, it shouldn't be that hard to test that. So what we do, we're building complicated UIs, is basically every time we get very much UI code that goes in, we measure the amount of code. I forget what the current threshold is. We freeze the, freeze the code base for three days, maybe just one day. Everybody switches and works on everybody else's code because that way they actually find out what other people are doing. Uh, we do pairing some of the time, not all the time. But when other people have to use the product you're building, they actually understand what it is. They get zillions of bugs, so the JIRA or your bug list goes way up. Uh, they go up hundreds, and it goes like this. Because you get all these things off by a pixel, this menu thing's missing. You know, all these things for which you could never write tests even if you wanted to. Um, within two or three days, all those bugs get closed, and they're typically never coming back. When you do this frequently enough, the quality of your UI improves. I'm not claiming it's best practice, but it's the best thing that I know for constantly changing sophisticated UIs. Uh, if you can show me how to automatically test this, I'll be happy and I will advertise your name and lights every place I go. But this is the best practice that I know for doing it. The other thing, which is an old way, is to actually have two people write the same program. There's a different kind of pairing. So you have essentially independent implementations. There's a couple of places where it's really effective. Uh, you know, for instance, if you're doing something that's algorithms, Eric Meyer and uh, Brian Beckman uh, do this all the time. I know several other people, David Leaves, they basically write the stuff in Mathematica. So they've got this and they generate uh, examples from the Mathematica. And then they compare that with the actual implementation, say C Sharp or Java. Two independent models. And Mathematica is really cool, right, if you're doing anything with math, obviously. Um, the other is for doing big operations on databases. Like major transformations, like I've done a lot of database restructuring. High performance database restructuring means you have to swizzle things fairly cleverly. You can't actually use the database itself. It's done under the hood. So what we have independent test or implementation of that. These are very, very effective, and they're often much cheaper than trying to write a lot of complicated tests. Particularly for things like data, there's a lot of invariance in the data, so all you have to do is essentially test the invariance. This is just an example, and I'll finish here. This is a company uh, that we talked to. Basically, they had a, a manufacturing product, very, very successful. They happened to build it on an old database, you know, they built it on top of, you know, Gemstone, that's an old database now, uh, Gemfire. Uh, or maybe they built it on top of uh, DB2, or pick, pick whatever database you like to hide. Hey, you know, um, CouchDB, whatever it is. 
And of course, the, the first thing is they couldn't report, for, this wasn't a normal uh, relational data, queryable database, so none of the customers could report. All their end users wanted to report. So we already learned this trick. You see, I really don't know very much. I just keep using the same tricks. So the first thing is we implemented an ODBC interface to their old database. It doesn't do everything an SQL could do, but it does most of the things that people need for reporting. Went to a user group meeting, you know, three months, usually with there's users screaming, we want to get off of this product, we want to convert, but we really like the, what, the stuff it does, but we want, we're worried about the vendor and the technology and the fact we can't report from it. They announced, you can now use, you know, your favorite crystal reports or whatever it is. The fans go wild, they even place a few orders. Companies gone from being in rack and ruin to having a chance. But we still got to get the data out. How are we going to get the data out? Well, basically, we need to get this locked in data. So we basically brought in an expert systems integrator. And we did a high performance bulk transfer from the old database to the new database. This is something that uh, I made my living at um, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, so we can move any data to anything else, restructure the database at disk speed. Essentially, it's database refactor. Um, but it's very complex, it can be quite tricky. So rather than try and test this code, we actually had a separate company develop an independent test and comparison program that basically verifies the properties of the connection of the data, the financial information that's in it, checksums the data, and so on and so forth. All done in three months. So you'll see that I'm really an old dog. And I really don't have any new tricks. But often, if you think out of the box and you say, look, if anybody else is going to do this, they're going to need a lot of smart people. And we don't have that many smart people. So what we need to do is find a smart way where we can write less code and do it. And using tables, getting to use query. Query is the gateway drug to functional programming. So I talk about collection-oriented programming because I don't want to scare anyone. I'm not going to say monad in the, in the audience and upset anyone. But the future is going to be about writing programs with query. Today, the people who write optimizing compilers you know, really complicated where they used to have tree walking, find all the data, where the dead spots, allocate the registers. They do that with queries. They write in a language called data log, which is equivalent to SQL, uh, just a different syntax. And if you're a closure person, you'll be excited because Datomic uses data log. But more and more things you can do with query. And when you can do very powerful query, you don't have to have all this complicated stuff. You don't have to save all this state. You can just have immutable data and work on it very quickly. Thank you very much. I've probably gone way over time. It's a privilege to be with you, and I hope there's at least one thing, like property-based testing, that you can take away with you. Um, thank you a lot. I hope we'll see some. I'm happy to take questions. Um, or corrective remarks. <laughs> He's already got it now, so he can't have it. He has to wait till the other people. Um, so on the screen you'll see a couple of questions that already have been submitted. So we're doing our Q&A session tonight through Pigeonhole. So if you want to just jump on to pigeonhole.at, A-T, um, slash Yao Knight, Y-O-W Knight, you can vote for questions that are already on there, or you can submit your own. You can do it anonymously or put your name up there, and then we'll start the Q&A session. Sergey, your screen is actually going to help us uh, facilitate that. So, Sergey, do you want to right. jump to the front? Well, my job is easy. I'll just read uh, the questions today, and that's about it. Uh, I, I've heard he actually changes the question and makes it harder. <laughs> uh, Right, so uh, Dave, uh, the most watered uh, question is how do you validate that scale? The answer is we run it, we run it in the production environment. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I don't always test, but when I test, I test in production. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I assume you have a quick way to revert to the previous version. If well, and, and typically we don't. We're not actually. We're not actually mutating things. So we're in. We're in the production path. So we're running against the production data. But we're typically the other thing we do is take a take a back up. We don't need to. We, mm -hmm. we, the data is stable enough, so we we'll also we also can take a backup copy of the data last weeks or whatever it is because what we're testing is can we run this fast enough you know will we get the answers right things like that so you can also do it against the backup uh, you know, so maybe a, a follow up on this uh, I don't know who who asked the question but did you mean the performance scale or did you mean the organization scale uh, no no specificity maybe they can submit it again okay so, right. My view of the way companies change is you basically establish small teams like this that do these things and you get one and it works and you get another then it works and so then you've got these sort of you know, you know, SWAT teams that you can put on important problems. Systemic transformation is expensive. Uh, it's a nice idea but it doesn't deliver value in my point of view to the organization. Spending a whole lot on a big agile transformation is a good thing to get the health of the organization, to have people sort of consistent testing in principle, well, lots of people that claim they're agile don't have a CI environment at all, which is crazy. Uh, I thought so, Java so, is enough. Java is enough, that's right. Java is correct. From the <laughs> uh, and by the way, you can vote for the questions that you want to pop on top uh, and answer it. Uh, quicker so uh, on that URL as well. So Dave, if uh, tables are so much better, why are Cucumber style tools more popular than uh, fitness style tools? Well, good marketing for one thing. Um, I think I think fit, fitness only has one kind of table, right? It was a very simplistic tool. The tables I'm talking about actually have meaning in the domain and are usable as a domain. So they're actually domain tools that people who are analysts or people who specify things. Uh, use like spreadsheets, decision tables, state tables. Those are tables which have meaning and then can be directly interpreted. I, I think it's, it's really just marketing and developers like syntax, so you know they like the idea of another language. Cucumber is fine. It's just extremely verbose. I mean, then BDD is a great idea. I mean, Dan, Dan and Koiko are both good friends of mine. Koiko will be here in September. Uh, you know. But my point is, why spec by example when I can just run the example? So I'm programming by example, right? If I can give you the spreadsheet and run it, why do I want to convert it to tests? So what about uh, this double bookkeeping that the TDD is supposed to promote? Uh, I can I, I, I test the, the spreadsheet interpreter, mm -hmm. so that works. So I test that with conventional tests. I can write cucumber mm -hmm. tests. So I test that with regular tests, property-based tests. You know. But once that's correct, all I'm doing is interpreting the table. So mm -hmm. I'm not changing anything. So there's no, you know, it's perfectly legitimate. I mean, the thing is tested. And it's much smaller. Maybe right? yes. the program's obviously correct. Yes. Right. Well, it's been proved. I mean, it's, it's been tested. The interpreter has been tested. So all you're doing is doing, is basically interpreting. Okay. What do I think about the Spring Jam, Spring Boot? I think it's really interesting. I mean, I was with uh, I was just with uh, Josh Long in uh, Perth, and uh, uh, during one of our several speaker dinners, uh, I got an update. I think I mean I think it I think it's a really interesting way to go. And I think what they're doing, you know, if you, if you believe the portable, you know, this is once again Java's portable, uh, provided you use Spring. Uh, uh, I think it's very interesting. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a very nice framework. Uh, personally, I like to use a sort of Martin Thompson subset of Java. So I actually prefer just to write small, really small Java applications, and to have a lot of those be kind of interpreters. And you know, I could guess I could use Spring Boot for doing that, but I don't find, you know, the one thing I learned from object-oriented programming is that frameworks are a bad idea. Uh, they inject dependencies into your program. But I think of the frameworks out there, it's quite clean, and the fact you can do it on multiple cloud platforms, I think it's, it's very nice. So I, I mean, I, I think it, Spring's a very, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud are really quite interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have to program in Java anymore, so. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so how should bigger product companies do agile since you said enterprise agile is an oxymoron? Would love to hear more about your experience with IBM. Some of their results seem great. Well, you know, the marketing department can make anything spin. <laughs> I think I think on the transformation side for organizations, you know, anything you can do in a big organization to change the culture so you get people working together and so on is significant. So again, an agile transformation, ten percent improvement in a big company is a lot to the bottom line. Giving a quality of life to people to the software, giving predictability to the organization, these are all big benefits. It just turns out that the CEOs that I worked for expected a lot more. What they really expected was agility. And so, you know, the problem is Agile doesn't bring the productivity and doesn't bring the flexibility, changeability, and so on. Like, I mean, you've got a whole bunch of applications and tables, they're in queries. People can change those, even people that are not, you know, professional developers. So it's really about how quickly can you flip things and churn them. And I think you know, the fact that many people are still doing OO and still doing unit testing despite the fact that there's been better things for 10 years is kind of disappointing. Right? Are you going to die an object-oriented programmer? <laughs> Please. You know. Look, and hey, I'm old, but I programmed in every new program. By the way, anybody heard of structure analysis design? Did your granddad do that? You know, you do these data flow diagrams, everything like that. You remember that? Yeah. They're called microservices. <laughs> That's what they were. They had the right idea, but the wrong implementation. Except in Japan, where they actually run the data flow diagrams as separate processes in some of the banks. They're the only people I know in the world who actually took data flow and implemented it as microservices in the 70s. Okay, why do you recommend that uh Eliminate as much data cache as is possible. So, caching is the the one trick, the biggest, the one trick pony for performance. The problem is cache management is tricky, and as soon as you get into maintaining server side ca like data database cache, you know, mid tier cache, client side cache, you have to maintain all the consistency between these, and so caching can get quite complicated. So, if you can basically have something that's fast enough. So you can just take, give me the data, which is what you can do with most in-memory databases. You have the full power of a database that can select and get the thing, and so you can just use queries against it, and you don't need the intermediate cache. You know, obviously, you know, caches can help, but in general, they give you inconsistency and complexity. And when you get a cache problem, they're really hard to debug, and they're hard to test. Okay. Um. So, by the way, please keep the questions coming and uh, words up. I like Zipkin. <laughs> and <laughs> All right. Can you, I can interfere to the questions I can answer. <laughs> okay. So, our software engi uh, engineering courses fail us, uh, fail us uh, as the focus is so much on uh, object oriented and object oriented analysis. And, Design. So, uh, I am still uh, an adjunct professor, and in the courses that we have, we always insist that basically we have what we call the neat and the scruffy. In the neat stuff, we teach people like what computation is about. So, if you've read the Wizard book, that's what Bob Martin calls it because he didn't know there was, you know, he didn't know it. It's called Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs by Abelson and Sussman. If you read that book, you will think differently about computation. If you make it through Haskell, you will think about it differently. But if you don't understand that computation is about essentially environments, where, where the bindings are, and moving the processor together, so what's the difference between object-oriented programming and functional programming? Object-oriented programming, like dealing with states, specifically, just like you're juggling with state and object-oriented. Yeah, but in terms of the, in terms of how the programming language evaluates. No, I. I yeah. the, but, but it's sort of the same. Sorry. Uh, that's a one question. I wanted to answer that question. So the difference is, if you understand computation, is that basically in one case, 
you basically get the function, the method name, and you have to go look up in the environment. That's called object-oriented programming. In the other case, you get the environment and you find the function. So you get, you get the function and the environments. You have to look up the environment in the lexical scope. But if you actually understand what a metacircular interpreter is, you can find all the differences between all these different programming languages. So if you teach something like the wizard book, or there's the equivalent in Haskell, you can do it in other languages, you get to understand what evaluation is really. And then the next person comes along and says, oh, this is Go. What's it like? You just look at it and say, OK, the type system's like this. Here's how it does the binding. Oh, it uses CSP for messaging. OK, I sort of know what it is. So that's why some people can quickly go from one thing to another, because they know there's not much difference between these things. There's a type system, uh, there's some control statements, you know, there's some operations, there's an evaluation order, there's scope rules. And so any worthwhile department in computer science will teach that ideally in second or third year. Uh, in America, we tend to teach scheme. I'm in North America, I'm Canadian. Uh, in uh, Europe, in certain areas, it's often Haskell. Some other places, at Miranda or other things, but basically seeing different kinds of computational models, seeing what prologue's like. In prologue, you don't really have variables. You have binding chains that you take, but the evaluator is very easy to write. So in one course, we teach students how to implement prologue with object-oriented programming, pure functional programming, uh, with you know, no, no, no force evaluation. Thanks. Um, so which one is better for partial uh, text searching database, uh, cache database or in-memory database? For searching? Well, I mean, I think if you, well, if, if you want to, if you search in the cache, then all you can see is what's in the cache. <laughs> so if you, you really can't search the whole database, you can only search what you put in the cache. Does the author of the question want to specify anything else for this? I may miss the question. You probably put it in the cache because your database isn't fast enough. All right. What are technologies for directly interfacing and querying hardware? Directly interfacing? You're talking about building hardware like VHDL design languages, or are you talking about uh, talking directly to like the Intel latest Intel chip? So. You're talking about doing low-level programming against the actual hardware, like the CPU and so on. Is that, is that the question? Uh, probably your example of uh, fact, uh, factory controlling system. So, I mean, most of the things that, um, to, to get to low level, I mean, you're constrained by what languages run on the machine. Um, most of the time, if you really want to get to the hardware, you need to get something that lets you, that generates instruction sequences that are predictable. So you want to use a compiler or a language which you can actually see the code that it generates because lots of things promise, like in C, in the old days you could say register in C and you actually put the result in a register. Now it just goes, don't say that, I know better, I'll choose which register to use. So that makes it very hard to write a virtual machine because it's hard, you can't write it in C because you can't control the register allocation. So C isn't a very good low level language, but unfortunately there is no language on which you can say cache A, B, C, D because caches are based on the statistical usage of the data. So you have to know a lot more about your algorithm. But today, uh, the, mod, the new assembler is called LLVM, bit code. So you really, you know, almost every machine, every compiler will now generate, or interpreter for that, will generate LLVM bit code, which is kind of portable machine code or portable language. So if you want to do that, I would say look at that. But if you're working in old hardware like process control, basically you have to find, probably it's the C compiler that you can use. And then you turn on the, used to be called the listing option, and you actually see the machine code that's generated. And you code very carefully, because if you do anything fancy, uh, a compiler often you know, spills things to registers, so you don't write anything complicated. And usually you can do that. If you're on a modern hardware and you can use Java and you read uh, Martin Thompson's Mechanical Sympathy blog, he'll show you how you can do really high performance stuff in Java, but you have to use the Java intrinsics. 
Same with C++14. C++14 has stuff to deal with concurrency and cache lines and things like that. But it gets pretty specialized. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you want people moving away from doing that, because most programmers do not have the sophistication to do that. You know, and the hardware changes. For instance, the new hardware has vector instructions on it now, so there's 512 bit, I'm oh, sorry, the current hardware is, I guess, 256 or 128. The next generation have 512, so you can actually do vector instructions, so you can do an add of 16 or 64 words at one thing. <laughs> very hard for you to figure out how to generate that instruction. The only way you can do that is by having control of the machine. And that probably means you're going to have to wait for the C compiler two years after the hardware came out. In our case, we control the generation of the machine code, so we can get on new hardware within a couple of months. But that's because we generate all our own stuff. But if you rely on the C compiler, the Java compiler, it's going to take a year or two for them to catch up. You know, they've got to change the JIT and a bunch of things or the C++ compiler. This hardware is changing quite a bit. So my advice is unless you really know how to... On small machines like if it's an ARM or a Raspberry Pi, you're, you're fine. You can just do it with C or you can do it in assembler. Mind you, Raspberry Pi is overkill for most applications. It's really a desktop with a lousy screen and keyboard. You want a real microcontroller, you know, go work on a PIC or something like that, because those are cheap and you can use them and you can put them out in your lamp posts and other things like that. And they can they're very inexpensive. But you see you need real programmers for those because they're sixteen bits and you can't use Java and C sharp on those for instance. So you have to be kind of a real program. Maybe program with tables. All right, uh, the last question so far. How do you assert if an organization has the trust culture the prerequisite? How do I assert? Um, it's pretty easy. You walk into an organization, you can usually smell software burning. Um, so the first thing is you can listen to the release beat. You can listen to the continuous build. You can look at what the teams look like. Are they reacting? Are they having fun? You can talk to the management. Do they believe in the tooth fairy? You know, often executives believe in the tooth fairy. You know, they, they, they don't really understand software. Look, I was an IBM vice president. Uh, I can tell you out of, I don't know how many, I think we were 200 vice presidents. Just to want to make sure that was really significant. <laughs> 200 of us, and, and most of them got paid more than I did. And basically, uh, but I would say, generously, there were 10 people at that level who actually understood what software was. And that's why we have this revolution in Yao. We want to get you people up the ladder so that in a generation from now, or half a generation, you know, the leaders, and there are already many companies, uh, I was at the SG Power, uh, you know, great organization. I uh, you know many of you know them. A uh, few of them worked here, uh, or here, you know. Uh, you see the teams working at Pivotal, you see the teams working at ThoughtWorks, and their customers. These people get it, but we've got a big journey. But if we can network together and we can learn from the best in the industry and share our techniques, in five years, Singapore will be a different place because you guys will change it. And our privilege is hopefully to be able to share a little experience and bring some people that have done things wrong before and share what we've done wrong and maybe a few things we've done right. Uh, and try and convince you that you can do it. But you'll have to take some risks. Doing the things that I'm talking about are risky. But when they work, you, and just, you do this three times in the organization, you will find out that the whole organization is yours. You screw up and you'll be out. <laughs> but no risk it, no biscuit. Right? But if you want software to be better, those of you who are really talented need to take those risks. Many of you are, you're changing your organizations, and I've had the privilege of, to visit some this week and hopefully more. But you can just tell where there's trust, right? One is, do, do the executives ever travel from that place in the sky to where the software people and walk around and talk to them? Right? 
or do they only go by, you know, hoping that no one gets in with a t-shirt and smelling? It's a test. I've had to take executives from billion dollar corporations and push stop on the developer floors and walk around with them. But many of them are afraid because they don't understand what you're doing. So one of the things you have to do is take the time to explain to other people what you're doing and take your patience. You know? Many people, the world's changed a lot. And people who are older in software have a lot of skills. They know how to do designs and things very differently. But we come in and go, oh, you're a bonehead. You're developing in Jab. I can't believe anybody uses that old stuff anymore. I'm just using what you used on the COBOL program. Your time will come. So what you have to do is respect those different technical cultures because they can tell you a lot about what you know high performance transaction process. If you want things to go past, you don't use threads. Threads are a really bad idea. We've known this for a long time. You batch them and you run them through a single process. That's how you get performance. That's how all high performance systems work. They don't use threads. And you don't have to worry about semaphores, peeing and being on things getting talked up in thread locks and all those sort of things. You just keep it simple and fast. Those are things that someone old can show you. You can show them how cool it is to do this. And look how expressive it is now. I can just do this with a map and a reduce. And my code is so much simpler. And it's so much cleaner. So technocultures really put barriers in. And they're much harder to deal with than working between Japan or Singapore and Canada. Right? So. If you reach out to the other side, remember most of the people, the people who do, the people who do, you know, all those people in HR that don't listen to you, or the people who make you do stupid reports. They didn't make those up. They, you know, they got PeopleSoft, God forbid, and now the whole world is driven by PeopleSoft. Right? You can't even redefine a group because they control the LDAP. It's really ridiculous. But you just have to think that these people are kind of an API, right? And the only way you can speak to them is by sending them spreadsheets, you know, or Microsoft Project. So just, you know, just respect the API. Don't reach in the organization. You can't change their code, right? Just respect the organizational API. You know, have your automatic build produce Microsoft Project or whatever they want. I mean, when I do that, you know, the people come out, the finance office comes out and hugs me and says, Wow, you're so great because all the rest of the agile people told us to get stuffed, we're stupid and brain dead. You, know, you love us, you just give us Microsoft Project and everything like that. And all I did was just take it and give them what they needed. It's not their fault that they need Microsoft Inc. on the project or PeopleSoft or Primavera or whatever these arcane tools are. So part of it is trying to respect those people in the other organization, trying to understand what motivates them, how can you help them, right? When you go to the DBA, it's hard to change the database, right? They, it's not like, you know, doing Ruby code. So when you go, get lots of space, you know, put lots of extra tables in, right? You know, make some planning. It's like, you know, when you re renovate a building, it's not simple refactoring, right? There is some physics involved. Well, databases are like that too. So when you renovate a building, you always try and get more space. If you're smart, you know, all the companies do what they do is get the biggest empty space they can, and then they lose it as they grow. Anyway, I've talked too long. No worries. Um, do you think Ethereum blockchain would disrupt the software space uh, with their smart contracts and dApps, as many big software companies have joined the Ethereum enterprise? Uh, and many have joined, and many have left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact, so, yeah. Uh, I think Ethereum is a really good thing. Blockchain is a, an amazing, uh, very interesting thing. We have a company that implemented as a, a complete uh, Bitcoin exchange. It was implemented in a few months. Uh, it's actually trades derivatives and other instruments using Bitcoin as the. Um, I don't know whether Ethereum will disrupt. I think block, blockchain definitely will uh, disrupt. In the end, I, for me, I think blockchain is going to be an API that I talk to. The, the thing for blockchain to work, it has to be widely used. And so that means there's going to be some winners and some losers. I just like to know which one it is, because otherwise I'll have to write five different APIs, and the APIs for blockchains are really terrible right now. Ethereum is a better one. So, um, yeah, I think it'll make a difference for some people's business. Maybe it'll put me out of business because I do fast data. Maybe they won't need it anymore, blockchain. 
but you know, there's still there's still lots of issues with blockchain. And one of the issues, very simply, is how many people think there aren't governments or individuals that can get enough computers to actually take over the blockchain. I know a company that does analytics on blockchain. They actually they actually know over 30% of the blockchain nodes. When you know that percentage of the blockchain nodes, uh, you now can statistically predict a lot of things that are going on. So we don't know really uh, how secure it is. Now obviously in a closed loop, so if it's all the banks or all, you know, all the container shipping companies are using it and secure and you know, they can do that, that probably works. But I don't think it'll, I still think people are gonna wanna do things and some of the blockchains are computationally pretty expensive. All right, thank you. Um, is Google Protocol buffer better than JSON in terms of speed for transportation of data over wire? Like JSON are better than XML? Well, you know, JSON, JSON has smaller brackets. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, Google Protocol, the real issue is if you're in objects, you know, then Google Protocol buffers, you know, if you don't know about SPE, is, is considered to be fairly fast. Right? It's not actually there that fast, but it's fairly So if you're using an object-oriented language, then protocol buffers is often the way you want to do it. Obviously, if you just, if you already got JSON in your store, then you can do it. Um, in general, I don't like sending text around, so. Um, and by the way, when I said query API, everybody heard, anybody heard of Facebook GraphQL? So for many years I've been insisting that basically REST is a broken idea. You have all these REST endpoints. In the end, all you really want to do is query the web and get your answers back. You heard me, query, query, query. And Facebook QL is a first attempt to do that. So instead of a whole lot of REST endpoints, you would just have a query. One API for anything query. Obviously updates a different issue. So I believe that's the way things are gonna go and we're gonna end up getting rid of a lot of these REST endpoints. And all the complicated maintenance and testing and everything like that. Because in the end, most of the things people are doing are just getting data from it. And if you put the, if you put the query inside the client, you don't even have to have all the complicated bubbling. You can just look at the timestamps on the versions, you can delta the things that have changed on your windows and then just update the relevant stuff. So I think we're not really there with where UI is gonna go. React's very interesting, uh, you know, but it's still hellishly complicated to build UIs when all you really do is have a collection on the server and a subset of a collection in your phone and you click on things you want, and you have to do all this stuff to do some an application that's really, really simple. So I think we'll head that way. I'm okay. done. Where do I see the future of technology? Last question. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous. Where do I see the future of technology? Well, I think I've told you basically uh, CPUs and memory are going to be free. Uh, a lot of this complicated stuff. I don't believe distributed computing is really hard to do right. If you're a fan of distributed databases, because there are times when you need them, uh, please look at Jespin, or don't call me maybe. Just Google that. Jespin, don't call me maybe. Don't call me maybe comes from Carly Ray Simon. Uh, you know, the song that my granddaughters like to sing. Right? And, uh, what uh, uh, Kyle Kingsbury does is he breaks every distributed database system in existence. At least, usually, most of them once or twice a year. Distributed computing is really hard to do right. Uh, in many cases, it's easier just to keep the new stuff plus the old stuff and use those. Um, Google gave up on it. There's something called Google Spanner. Google Spanner was done for AdWords because Google, it was way too complicated to try and do it with distributed computing. Distributed computing is wonderful when it works. When it breaks, it's really hard to debug. The people doing React and things like that, they're really smart people. There are people who do it. But Google Spanner basically uses atomic clocks. Again, hardware is cheap. 
put an atomic clock in each of your data centers around the world, you won't have to worry about time synchronization. You know, we, we carry time in our database in nanoseconds in the native type. Uh, we believe it will go to picoseconds in five years. Uh, but atomic clocks are cheap. Right? So you can say having, oh, I'm, my NGTV server is too slow, I can't do that. You know, it's an atomic clock, just ask it to time. Right? It's hardware. So I think in many cases, things will be much simpler. So if you use memory and you start looking at programming as query, uh, you'll be surprised what you can do. Uh, you don't need a lot of complicated data structures. One of the things this hardware does is you get rewarded for just going through things linearly. Uh, that's why I use vectors, because hardware is rectangular and I have no NVDs, no objects, no anything like just native types and they flow into the caches and through very, very quickly. And more and more people are figuring that out. And with compression, you can actually do this on the fly. So, you know, I think programming is going to become much simpler. And when you give tools like we do self-serve analytics, so we can work on trillions of rows and write, write the code visually, so normal people can do it, not smart people like you, um, you know, then you can change the dynamic because then you can let people work on the data yourself. And when you can replicate that data into big memory boxes, the whole way you do computing changes. And we have to make things much simpler. And we need a breakthrough in the UI stuff. I have an analytic product, and 70% of the code is JavaScript. And we use as little JavaScript as possible. We keep things very simple, but it's very fragile and hard to test relative to our other code. So we need to change. So I think and I think the work that Facebook is doing and things like that. So I think those things are going to happen. Computers are just going to get faster and smaller. Uh, I'm not worried about machine learning writing any programs while I'm alive. Uh, maybe for some of you younger it might be an issue, but machine learning is an important tool. But machine learning is good at looking at ye yesterday's data. Right? It's not very good at predicting the future. So one of the, I built this analytic environment for uh, cyber analysts, people looking for problems in cyber, cyberspace. And in cyberspace, you know, the bad guys don't actually use the same algorithm that they used the last time. So your machine learning can figure out what that was, but it's like fitting a regression formula to last, you know, the last 10 years of economic data and using it to predict the future. So humans are still going to be involved in the loop and uh, surveillance in the financial markets. All more and more things require a human looking at a visual, seeing a pattern, and say, okay, machine learning, go find all this pattern. But the machine learning doesn't find it. It doesn't write the programs yet. And I think that's a fair way to work. But machine learning is an interesting tool. On the other hand, it's kind of a specialized tool. It doesn't work for everything. But I think it's very important to become familiar with it. Uh, Google TensorFlow is really pretty easy to use, uh, you know, but not everybody has an application. I think security is a nightmare. Uh, we're going to have to change that. I think everything will become encrypted, uh, and I think that uh, I think you'll see uh, IoT devices being mandatorily provided with you know, certificates or time-expired tokens or capabilities so that we can finally have some sort of security there. I think that's going to happen a lot faster because the IoT industry is not going to exist unless it steps up and solves its own problem. Automotive is already heavily threatened by the problems of automotive security. So I think we'll see a lot more breakthroughs there in terms of security, and separation and isolation helps that a lot. And having people program in safe languages helps a lot. Uh, languages where you can get at the machine need to be taken away from people except for those that need them. And I, while I do think formal proofs and everything like that are a great idea, we're not going to see that mainstream for some time. There's some incredible stuff done with proving correctness. Of why, why wouldn't we? Because it's just too hard. Right now it takes a team of PhDs to prove very simple thing, very interest, anything interesting correctly. Yeah. But know. most of the is like boring and simple, so like, and we can prove it with those. Uh, there's a whole lot of skills you have to have to actually prove programs correct. 
and uh, most people don't have them. You, you clearly have the skills to do all these things, but I don't, I don't think that applies. And I'll, if you just look up the, the Yao talk by Catherine Fisher, who ran the DARPA program in security and is one of the leading people in the world, she'll tell you that it's going to be some time. Yeah, but you don't need a lot of people with uh, proving, like, to able, like, to write provers or, like, work with provers to prove uh, something. No, just setting up the stuff and just annotating it and getting the information into the prover is really hard. I'm yeah, not but talking about it. Like, you don't need, like, many people. So, like, plenty of software engineer and one guy who, like, can write, like, prover. So, so I really believe that you think that the rest of the world is in a different planet than you are. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know. uh, please, please look at Catherine. She's the world expert. You know, I'm, I'm only quoting from her. You know, I'm not a security expert, so. Uh, but you know, I've tried to use verifiable stuff in many things, and it's, it's very time-consuming and very hard. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks, everyone, for coming.